Now we're going to switch over to uh, our friend uh, Stephen Bergman of New York Classical. Let me find another shot. Hey, Stephen, there you are. Hey, Rodney, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. How about you, Stephen? I'm good. A little tired, but good. Well, I'm tired because you just came off of a, I'm sure, a marathon rehearsal for your next production of Team Leader. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's, been, it's, been, it's been a long one. It's good. It's all good. And that is coming up this Thursday night, Thursday. the twenty fifth at eight p.m. on Facebook, right? Uh, no, no, it's it's uh, we're Zoom. It's a Zoom, but you have to register at our website, NewYorkClassical.org, NewYorkClassical.org, to get your link. Okay, all right. So uh, something that for me is really kind of fascinating about the, the fact that you're taking on King Lear right now is that you guys, for for how many years you guys have been New York Classical? It's about fifteen years. Twenty one. 21 years. 21 that, years. That's, year. I think you guys would be probably one of the longest running continuous Shakespeare uh, companies in New York outside of the public theater. Yes, this is true. Well, a classic stage uh, beats us a little bit, but now you're going too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that, well, you guys are certainly in the running. You're, you're right. Yes. Here. Yeah, we are. We're around. We've been around a while. And, and you guys are renowned. Uh, you've been doing your shows in Central Park for the majority of that time. Yep, that's correct. Uh, and you, you're you're very well known as one of the one of the finer uh, companies in New York, not just for Shakespeare, one of the finer classical companies. And I I thought in your shows you, know, you guys do fantastic work. And something we chatted about uh, the previous time that we we had a chat here on Instagram Live was that you guys have a very unique style. Tell us about your for anyone who's new to uh, to this. Uh, tell us about your your style of, of um, how you got to New York classical. Well, it's called panoramic theater. And it's really based on three major points. It's uh, the show is adapted for each location. So, and the audience follows it from place to place. And the audience is also in the same environment as the show. So that's the, the, the kind of three pillars behind it. Okay. And so with it, it's a very immersive environment for Shakespeare. There's no stage. There is no seating. The audience brings a blanket. Oftentimes, sits on the grass or stands. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's you're in you know the audience experiences the play the same way the characters are experiencing. And and what that meant for me at the time that I came to see your show uh, a couple of times I came to see your shows uh, was that you know normally with the uh, uh, Shakespeare in the Park or whatever you know some kind of Shakespeare production here it's there is the, the barrier where the audience uh, is on one side of the proceedings and the performers on the other side and there's right. like that fourth wall between the one and the other. Mm -hmm. and, and with you guys, that's not really there so much because uh, your, your performers do a scene and then everyone says, all right, get up, get up and go, get up and do that. And you like the your picnic basket and off you go to the next part of the park and you run with the actors and then it's mm -hmm. off to the, uh, the next part of the set. And, and it's kind of, it's built into the, the surroundings of where you are in the park. Uh, that kind of helps them determine the, the, what, what scene is being played, correct? That's correct. That's correct. But, you know, we, we reinterpret scenes. Um, I, years ago, um, I think it was my third, second or third season, I was approached by a, an older gentleman who said, I spent, I've spent the last 20 years in the park and tonight you showed it to me like I've never seen it before. <laughs> and which is great, which is great. You know, I mean, we've, we've you know, the park has been a, uh, a villa in Russia for the seagull. The park has been uh, Illyria for Twelfth Night. Sure. The, the, you know, it, it, it's been France. It's been, it, it's been everywhere, um, right. and and England for sure, many many times over. Um, but you know that it's it's a you know like Central Park. It's an escape for New Yorkers, and you come into the park, and the whole world changes. We uh, some of our um, long longest term fans love the fact that because we when we move them around, they don't know where they end up. They get so wrapped <laughs> up in the show. And this is not just some. There's quite a few people that get so wrapped up in the show, frequently in the show, people are like, how do I get out of the park? And I'm like, oh, it's right <laughs> behind you. And they're like, oh, really? I had no idea. So, so uh, and, and you've been doing that for a long time. Uh, now, now that after 21 years of doing uh, park-based productions, for the most part, uh, now because of the, uh, the new situation with the coronavirus and how mm -hmm. we've had to adapt uh, what Shakespeare performance means here in New York and elsewhere, uh, you've had to change to the Zoom format. So how, how is it taking this very broad, physical, and I think you were telling me last time about how uh, it's such a physical style performance you had to mm -hmm. make sure your actors were up to snuff that they could physically handle the rigor of running from scene to scene ahead of the This breath. is true. This is true, yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm embracing um, the strengths and the challenges of both of Zoom. 
uh, one thing that works in our performance, uh, in our technique is, um, it's not, it's not, uh, always, it's not, we, we do it not to be obvious, but whoever's speaking is actually flat front to the audience. The audience sees them and that helps the projection. We don't use any amplified sound. They don't wear mics. They don't, we have no speakers or anything. And, we'll, and the technique allows them to be heard. Uh, and so actually it's pleasantly surprising. Six out of the seven actors in this particular lyric have worked with us in the past and they just jumped right in. Okay. And they, you know, but we are playing, you know, I feel a bit like a film director because I'm playing with, you know, camera angles. I'm playing with, uh, you know, how close can you be? How far can you be? Things like that, you know. So we had decided, uh, you know, there's a different look for an aside and what happens and in this particular um, uh, show where we have seven actors playing uh, 14, 18 roles, um, you know, and they're changing. And how do you do that as well? So, so how you said, I think you hit on something really important there that it's, it's almost like transitioning from stage to screen to, to film. In some ways, it is. In some ways, it is. And, you know, the question, our question has always been the heart of panoramic theater. The question is, is how much is just enough? We don't want to over. Uh, saturate the audience's imagination we want to maximize the audience's involvement imagine the audience's imagination and their involvement so in the same way here we're looking um how, how to maximize it what, what's it what, what's just enough so that the audience can suck into the story and, and you're doing it you said with the six actors correct seven seven, seven actors. actors yes so that, that in itself it, it, you're you're minimizing in a lot of ways you're taking a a big show and you're, you're reducing it to not only to the screen but also to uh, seven actors. Well, so, the, the, fun, the funny part was this was the show we had planned before uh, before COVID hit. Nobody, of course, expected it. And it came out of this uh, investigation I've been doing for a few years about what Shakespeare's company would have been like on tour. Okay. So, of course, uh, ironically, I guess you'd say, is uh, Shakespeare's company was forced to go on tour usually because it was a play. So now we have our own pandemic at this time. And I was, and you know, but this came out of that investigation of, um, you know, the actors had to go on the road. They still had to make money. It was expensive to tour. How few people could they bring? How could they make the story come alive? Um, and what was necessary for it to come, you know, to be there? And uh, we did a six actor Romeo and Juliet a few seasons ago. That's where we're going to begin this experiment. And that's trying to be very successful. And the audience loved watching the actors switch clothes on stage. And this one, it's even more. There's even more. Mm. So it's been, um, we just got through, uh, uh, well, just past the heat of uh, the, the Blondie of Gloucester. And um, it's really exciting. It's really, really exciting. We we actually have our fight director on the show. He's starting tomorrow. That's We've so got... Um, a voice and speech coach who are in a, if you're familiar with Zoom, breakout rooms. We're doing breakout rooms with a voice and speech coach. We have someone specifically looking at backgrounds. Uh, we don't want to uh, tech it up too much because I don't want it to be a movie. It's not a movie. It's still a play. But our hope is, of course, to fully produce the show um, at a later date this year, sometime in 2020. And uh, we want to make sure that this uh, there's no disconnect so when people can see the reading, a ripper's reading, so we're hiring everyone they're getting off unemployment for a week and a half uh we're paying health care and pension and uh hiring everybody on union contract it's a real wonderful opportunity to get actors working and and a show that uh Kim, you mentioned uh, how, how shakespeare was touring uh, with his company during the breakouts of the plague uh, the black plague uh in uh, in elizabethan england and isn't it funny that, that that one of the things that he wrote in sequestration from the plague was king lear uh, well, I, I have to say that we think that was the case. We don't know for a fact. <laughs> There's a lot we don't know for a fact. And I think it's, it's gotten uh, a little bit too much. And, you know, there are some scholars who disagree with that. But there's a possibility that um, it was one of the plays that was that was done. I, um, a number of seasons ago, I directed Measure for Measure. And that actually, I, I felt the play, it's really interesting. Some of the scenes are very kind of typically fleshed out for Shakespeare. And some are very underwritten. And I thought, oh God, he must have pulled this out of a drawer and had to start, had needed a play immediately to get going. And sure enough, they are, they're actually more sure that Measure for Measure was written during the play. Really? During one shutdowns, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. 
So uh, we're not not 100 percent sure. It was it was a, it's a good possibility, but not, it's, not, it's not as good as not as sure Ben is measure for measure. So uh, if King Lear is famous, uh, at least in some people's eyes, uh, for the the big storm scene where mm-hmm. where Lear has his uh, so called madness and mm-hmm. you know the, the the storm rack and the whole thing. So how does one translate that to such a big uh, grand transcendent stage moment. How does one tr- uh, translate that? Well, we have to think back to, you know, Shakespeare didn't have a storm. In the old theater, they didn't have a rain curtain. What did they do? That was the question. That's the question I start off with. You know, my job, I think, interpreting Shakespeare for a modern audience is thinking about what was Shakespeare's original audience experience and how do I translate that for our modern audience? And in this case, I actually look at specifically, there's a line, the Tempest is in my mind. Lear says. So actually, Lear is going to be imagining the Tempest. Mm. And we're going to get to see the other people on stage with him, which is uh, Edmund, uh, excuse me, Edgar. Edgar is as poor Tom and the Fool and Kent, who's disguised as Caius, uh, looking at this poor bad man, thinking he's in the middle of a storm when the storm really is in his existence. That's, that's really interesting. Especially. And that keeps the audience in the, in the space. That keeps the audience in the same playing space with everybody else. I think that's a really great way to approach it because you, you right there, it's, it's in the text, and you are delving right into the, the matter of madness, uh, the, the madness that King Lear is, uh, is experiencing there. That's correct. So, Stephen, uh, people want to uh, check this out. They can find it by visiting you guys at newyorkclassical.org. Yeah, nyclassical.org. And uh, we have a King Lear page right there. You got to register to get the link. And if you can't make it Thursday, we will be it's, we'll be repeating all the way through Sunday. Fantastic. All right. Well, Stephen, best of luck. I think you guys all right. are fantastic. It's Thank always you. A pleasure chatting with you. And I'll do, I'll be check, I'm checking out that collection. Fantastic. Video. Great. Looking forward to sharing with you. Take care. Thanks, Steve. Bye bye. All right, so that was Stephen Bergman of New York Classical. They have their production of King Lear coming up this Thursday uh, via Zoom, and we chatted about that. Uh, you can uh, check that out at nyclassical.org or on their uh, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter feeds. Uh, sign up, get your link for that uh, production.